Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, praise be to Allah, the creator and sustainer of the universe, creator and sustainer of all of us. Welcome. So happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Noor Saadi. I'm originally from a small town in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is north of Chicago in the United States. I was born into a um, uh, Christian family, but not a very church-going family. We tended to find our belief in God and nature and music. We had a lot of music in my home. So as a young girl, I started uh, singing naturally, could make harmony naturally. And I would sing with my parents. My mother was an amateur musician. And I loved to sing. And I also, we had a piano in the house. So I had sort of a natural ability to play piano. I had a babysitter that taught me, of all things, a child's version of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And I think my whole love of classical music started when I was about five years old. And I was able to uh, start taking piano lessons when I was about eight and also joined a group, small group of singing girls that used to go out and do little programs all around the state of Wisconsin. So I was on stage about the time since I was eight years old singing and uh, fell in love with that, fell in love with performing to some extent and also the love of bringing uh, a bit of peace and enjoyment to people in their lives. This is how singing always was, or giving music to people was for me. We used to sing in uh, nursing homes for the elderly, and I would look around for the most sad person in the audience and work on that person until they smiled. So it was a bit of like trying to bring joy to someone in their life. So music was always that for me, is trying to bring a moment of peace or rest or enjoyment to someone's life. And I sort of uh, followed a musical path through middle school and high school, doing leads in the school musicals and things like that. By the time I left high school, I had also fallen in love with classical music very much. I had a music teacher in high school who was, became my mentor and guided me along the way. And I really loved classical music of everything. So by the time I entered university, I was in a degree for classical performance of music, vocal performance. And I finished with uh, my singing degree after four years and then started doing some intern work as young singers do in different companies, opera companies, and recital organizations around the United States in the summers, taking whatever job I could get singing locally so that I would start to learn my repertoire. And uh, young singers also, there's an ability or an availability to do church jobs where they would hire young singers to fluff up their church choirs and so forth. So I did a lot of singing in all types of denominations of church choirs, Christian church choirs, and also later on I would sing with Jewish uh, in synagogues also, their Friday night services and their holy days. So after a lot of years of internship, I um, finally made it to New York City. I did some traveling and auditioning in Europe, which was interesting when I went over to Europe and I went to Vienna, we had a chance to sing in Vienna when I was in college. And I noticed that the architecture outside Vienna changed. Suddenly from steeples, everything was domed. And I kept asking people, why are there domes? Why, why did the architecture change? And we don't know, we don't care. And we happened to form, perform in a great cathedral in Vienna that unlike most of the kind of dark steeplechased uh, cathedrals in Vienna, this one looked just exactly, later in hindsight, like a mosque. It had a dome top, it was Karlskirche in Vienna, and two minarets on the side. But inside it was a Catholic church full of all kinds of idols and gold and things like that. But it's funny when you look back in hindsight how Allah has been kind of guiding you and giving you samples of things along the way. So eventually after auditioning and trying to get a job in Europe, I ended up in New York City and started singing somewhat professionally and uh, again taking more church choir jobs and doing quite a lot of work with Jewish communities. So I had a lot of exposure to Christian worship and Jewish worship and after a few years in New York, I, I did some very good professional singing. I was part of the uh, New York Choral Artists, which is the uh, professional choir of the New York Philharmonic, which gave us an opportunity to sing with the 100 best uh, young singers in New York, plus in front of all the great conductors of the world, the great orchestras and the great soloists. And then I did quite a bit of solo work in New York City as well uh, with New York City Opera uh, Education Department and a lot of local uh, professional organizations and a lot of it was church music a lot of it was sacred music so there was always that um, intertwining of the theater and also the religious work as well and one of my favorite things to sing was called an art song which was just a singer and a pianist singing very beautiful repertoire of the classical uh, German composers like Brahms or Schumann Schubert 
and with very beautiful, very beautiful poetry of the great German poets. And a lot of it very religious and philosophical in nature. So this was something I love to do a lot. And uh, very happy seeing in New York. What a wonderful life. I was doing everything I ever dreamed to do and very happy doing this and not looking for anything else in the world. And after seeing a lot of different people practice religions, I thought, you know, as long as you're trying to get to God, it doesn't matter how you're trying to get to him as long as, th as that you are. And I would actually make prayers to God that are very similar to what we find in Quran. I used to say, almost like the Dua of Musa, uh, Allah, God, please make my voice beautiful and pleasing and remove the defects so that people can get the message that I want to give them. So it wasn't about come and hear my beautiful voice. It was more like I want to give you a message from the music. And again, it was the beautiful, uh, very high level music of these, the art song, which is kind of the pinnacle of classical music. So I was very happy doing this. I thought I had the dream job forever and living in New York, a city of many, many people. I loved coffee. I was one of the first people to grind my beans. I was way to have Starbucks and all those things. And I was always looking for great coffee shops in Manhattan that wasn't just brewed coffee. And I couldn't find anything. And suddenly a new coffee shop opened up in my neighborhood on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And I looked in and there was a very bearded, kind of dark haired guy. And I thought, hmm, he looks a little scary. And I was a little bit shy to go in. But one day I really wanted coffee and I had a quick job I had to get out and go to. So I ran in for coffee and found this very nice man who was Egyptian. And he started telling me you know, about Egypt and I loved meeting people of different backgrounds. I was always fascinated, even in high school, of learning about our foreign exchange students. And oh wow, Egypt, you know, tell me about Pharaoh, tell me about pyramids, tell me everything. And we got talking and he finally said that he was a Muslim. And I said, you know, I'm really embarrassed to tell you I don't know anything, wallahi, anything about your religion. I don't know a thing. I was busy singing, I wasn't looking at the news, this was the late 18, uh, 1980s. I wasn't paying attention to the world, so I wasn't looking at hijab or terrorists or anything like this. So he started telling me, and I was so shocked. I had been involved in monotheism, in you know, the Abrahamic religions all my life, and suddenly here's somebody telling me, we are the third part of the Abrahamic trilogy, if you will, from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. And I was shocked, I was 36 years old, I said, what? I've never heard of such a thing. He said, yes, all of our prophets are the same as you know in your Bible. And I said, what? I was starting to feel offended because, you know, I traveled, I was well read, I thought I was, you know, knew about religions and things, and I didn't know about this great monotheistic religion. And I said, why don't I know this? And why doesn't anybody else I know know this? <laughs> so I was really kind of hooked. The coffee was amazing. But I was kind of hooked on learning about this. And I said to him, are there a lot of Muslims? <laughs> and he said, yeah, like a billion and a half. So um, I was just entranced. And I kept going back for coffee and information literally every day. And he got to the point where he'd call me on the phone and say, wake up and smell the coffee and come on in. And I would just sit and drink coffee and ask questions. And one day uh, I came in and I found him reading this very beautiful book. And I'm an artist. As a musician, I'm an artist. I can't draw, but I can appreciate this type of drawing. And I looked at the calligraphy and it was gorgeous, you know, to my artist's soul. It was very beautiful. And I said, oh, this is your wonderful book. I don't suppose there's anything in English. He said, well, there is, we'll get you one. So he sent his friends out to get me an English uh, translation or meaning of the Quran. And then I really started reading and started asking more pertinent questions. And he was always there with answers. And alhamdulillah, he was very mainstream, alhamdulillah. So he was a good guide for me. And uh, as you read, you know, he would say, you know, start with the stories of Isa salam, about Jesus and um, help me to go through this. And my, my only stumbling block was that I didn't know Muhammad and I realized that Muslims revered Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so much. And I said, I don't know him and I don't want to confuse him with how Christians look at Jesus as something divine. So he said, you will learn, you will learn more about him as, as we go. But uh, as I read the Quran in English, I just felt as if puzzle pieces were going tick, 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 all coming together. And it seemed like it made great sense of history. It made great sense of religion. Like I, well, I always used to think, why do we have all these conflicting religions? Why would God send only one religion down and then all these people would decide on a different way to go? And the Quran made sense of that. It explained it very clearly. And I often tell people I liked it because I'm a bit pragmatic and 
I felt Islam was, I call it the thinking person's religion. And Allah often says, don't you hear, don't you see, don't you think. And I really like the fact that it wasn't just worship blindly, but think, use your reasoning. And I found a great deal of logic in Quran, a great deal of history, a great deal of psychology. I was a great student of psychology. And uh, I felt like it was the greatest book of human psychology. I would look at stories of the people of Nuh, Noah, for example, and I'd say, those are just like the people I know in my industry, performers, you know, they think they're all that, and <laughs> there's a lot of ego. So um, it was just little pieces falling together until it was, I didn't feel like I was losing anything, I was only gaining. I gained a better appreciation of who Jesus was. I gained a better appreciation of the point of the stories of the prophets that I had grown up with, not a bunch of animals getting on a boat two by two, but how Noah had to preach to his people for 950 years. That was the important message. And not so much the flood, not so much the, uh, the animals and things like that. I always felt that in the Quran, the focus becomes something much more specific when we hear the prophet stories. And again, the prophets are all great and wonderful people, whereas in the Bible, sometimes they're committing really heinous sins in a way. So it just, probably being an older woman and being a little bit settled and being a little bit pragmatic, I think, it just made total and utter sense. So within about six months, I was ready to take the shahada, alhamdulillah. And that was, you're going to do the math now, that was 33 years ago, alhamdulillah. Again, I said uh, before that it, it made a lot of sense out of religion and history. And the fact that it was so tolerant, it, we're all part of the same picture. The fact that we all started from Adam, and it just made sense that people deviated along the way, and Allah would send another prophet or messenger to bring people back. And we see that everywhere. You see it in every religion. You see it even within Islam now. We see make, people making deviations and, you know, hopefully coming back to the, the fast track or the sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path. Um, for me, um, the thing that I felt, as many of us do, that I've always been a Muslim, that that's, I always felt a little bit different than a lot of other people around me. I think I had a strong sense of the fitra against things that were haram, but were very common in the society. But there was something, if we pay attention to it, that's bothering us about certain things. And I think I felt that strongly as a child. And even in New York, in such a kind of crazy, wild place, um, there was a lot of opportunity to see things that were really crazy and feel that gut instinct that this is just so not correct. Even though I participated in some of those harams, of course, growing up in the West and so forth. But um, you don't feel like you miss any of that when you become Muslim. But for me, what changed the most in me is I was always curious about other people. And Allah says, you know, I created you of male and female and made you into tribes and nations so that you would know one another. And I was always the one who wanted to know the foreign exchange students, know the African Americans in my school, know even the children with disabilities, which was an odd thing. You know, there weren't a lot of us like that. So... Again, you feel like you've always been Muslim. So that was always part of me, but I became an information junkie once I became a Muslim. I couldn't learn enough. And learning, of course, is stressed so much in Quran. The first word of revelation really gets you iqra, read. It's not pray, it's not fast, Allah is only one. It's iqra, read, learn, seek knowledge. And that always really resonates in me that, and we see the first Muslim generations were very... Um, avid in their learning and the types of things that happened in Baghdad and then the, over in Al-Andalus, moving to the Ottoman Empire, there was this uh, search and thirst for knowledge. And I felt that was very strong in me and also the desire to want to share Islam with everyone. And my funny story is when I became Muslim, I wanted to go to the top of the Empire State Building and yell down, you just read the Quran, you just don't know. And you go running out to everybody thinking like I have this great truth. And you want to share it and because people know you and love you, like they're going to take it. And it was like, oh, no, you're crazy now. What happened to you? Are you ashamed of your body? You want to cover it? You know, this is crazy. This is nonsense. This is they're going to take you, make you a hostage and sex slave in <laughs> Egypt. No, I just want to share. And no one would even get point to the point of sharing. So I've always wanted to share. When I learn something, I want to share it with somebody else. And that's part of our Islamic adab, too, that you want to sh once you learn knowledge, you want to share it. So that was always strong in me, and just because we're recording this in Turkey, I just want to say that I started watching the Turkish series during COVID, and I became crazy about Ottoman history. I went to Spain, or before I went to Spain, I realized that you had to go and study the history because the Spaniards were not going to tell you anything about us. So I really read a lot and studied a lot, so I would know what I was looking at. And I think that sometimes we fall down as an ummah because we don't 
really know our history beyond the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Sahaba and the four righteous Khalifa. We don't get much beyond that, and we have a glorious history, which, of course, we would like to come back. And when you come to Turkey, you see a lot of that. <laughs> so that's my plug for Turkey, mashallah. Um, but uh, that's something that I, I read a lot, I study a lot, I travel a lot. We've been, alhamdulillah, we've had the wherewithal and the blessings of Allah that we can travel. So we've been to a lot of the great Muslim uh, centers of civilization, such as Al-Andalus and Morocco and now the, uh, the Ottoman world and the Arab world. My husband is Palestinian, and we've been going back and forth between Jordan, which is his home now, and the United States. I have a home in both places, in Dallas, Texas now, and uh, Amman. So it gives me a lot of opportunities to travel into the Muslim world, and that's been very edifying and very great to be able to uh, see all the, the great uh, history of our civilization. And may Allah increase our knowledge and help us to continue it, inshallah. Uh, before I converted to Islam, uh, my Egyptian friend would send his uh, friends to go out and buy, there were books, a few books in English uh, about Islam, mostly uh, translations, the Yusuf Ali, which is a very popular English meaning, which has now become very dated. Uh, I felt it read too much like the Bible in a way, but uh, because it had a lot of tafsir or uh, explanation, the Yusuf Ali was very valuable, and I was a read cover to cover type of person. And I read it, I would read it over and over again. Uh, when I became Muslim, and I started to see the mannerisms of Muslim, the dress of Muslims, and because I took it 100%, I realized that my career in the performance world probably wasn't very appropriate for me as a woman anymore. And, um, you know, getting on a stage in front of mixed audiences and beautiful gowns and stories, a lot of love stories and things, it didn't seem very appropriate. No one made me give it up. I just decided that that's, it was a page I could close of a chapter of a book. And I had done everything I wanted to do. I was, mashallah, I'd been able to sing in, in great places with great people and great music. So it wasn't as if I felt I missed something. So I was fairly easy, Allah made it very easy for me to kind of close that chapter of my life and go on to more of my Muslim life. So I've had two lives, inshallah. Um, and... Uh, so I, was, I gave up the music business, and because I gave up my music business, what was I going to do now? So I sat kind of quietly and just, I stayed in New York for a while, and I worked temporary jobs, which is a way that I used to supplant, supplant my uh, music career when I was younger. And I would just work temporary jobs and go back to my apartment and read Quran every day, like you'd read a novel, like every day, so many chapters, and from cover to cover, cover to cover, cover to cover. So to new Muslims, I would really recommend, to any Muslims, no, I'll take that back, to any Muslims, please read your Quran. I mean, this is our book. It is the guidebook for your life. It gives you, it's called the Furqan, which is the criteria between right and wrong. And honestly, if, it's, if that book is inside of you, it really helps you make decisions about the things you choose for your life and the things you do with your life. Uh, I, I think a lot of us don't read it frequently enough. Someone will say, a convert will say, oh, I read it once. I'm like, but it's your guidebook. <laughs> you know, it's your textbook for life. And the non-Muslims complain there is no, no handbook for life. There is for us, there is. And it's not changeable and it's protected by Allah's mercy. So uh, it's a book that will live forever. And now they are coming with more uh, relevance and uh, age-appropriate, perhaps, uh, meanings. Nowadays, it's easier for converts. It's easier and it's difficult because converts can find so much online. But something that my husband and I did when we got married is to, um, I took my musical background and I started making up little songs and stories for children, Islamic stories. I would Islamize nursery rhymes and Islamize Barney songs, if you're from that era. And we made some audios and they sold really well uh, across the English-speaking Muslim world. So, and I would also tell stories of the prophets and things like that, because I had that background. So uh, my husband got the idea, he'd been in, a, in the medicine, uh, medical world, and he got the idea to start a company in, in the United States because there wasn't a lot for Muslims in English in America yet. But there were, there were starting to be. It was the beginning of uh, Islamic multimedia in the 1990s in America. And we were one of three companies that were really starting this. And we would go out and wherever we could find Western quality books and softwares or CDs, anything like this, we would make a website and put it out there for Muslim families in the United States. So although I got it out of the music business, Allah found a halal way maybe for me to get back in. So uh, we were able to put out about, I think, um, eight or nine audio products and one DVD about the Prophet's life, peace be upon him. 
for children. And, but we joined a couple of other companies, and now there's been a, an explosion of Islamic multimedia in the West. There's so many books available, and now we have the internet, although the internet can be a scary place if you don't know what to look for. So having a good guide is important, a good and trusty guide. A lot of times a woman will convert to Islam, they'll say, well, let your husband teach you. It's like, no, yoke, 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 no, 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 <laughs> because they don't always teach you the right thing. There's a lot of cultural Islam. Uh, you know, if you're born Muslim, sometimes it's the part of the culture, but you pick up a lot of cultural baggage that isn't really purely Islamic. So again, I stress, you know, please read the Quran in any language that is your native language. There's so many translations and meanings now. Pick up a Quran and make it your best friend and read from it, not just to memorize it. You need, yes, you need to learn Arabic to uh, recite Quran in your prayers, and it's a beautiful language. And as you study Arabic, the meanings uh, reveal themselves to you more, but read it in the language that you speak and, and read the tafsir, the meanings in the language that you speak, because it's really essential. We cannot, we cannot depart away from this book. It's not something that we just read through in Ramadan or we read through it so we say, I'm Hafiz, I've memorized Quran, or my child knows so many juz, uh, you know, sections of Quran. It's really important to really take this book and ingest it and live it, inshallah. Allah is the best help, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, the more you ask Allah, of course, the more he gives you. And the more you, your intention, your niya, is to serve Allah, serve Islam, um, the help comes in ways that are unimaginable. And the older I get, the more I see that. The more dependent I am on Allah, the more I trust him. I have tawakkal and taqwa, um, firm awareness that he is with me always and watching me always and there for my help always. Um, it makes life much easier. Allah promises throughout the Quran that life is about tests. You are going to be tested. Every single person, rich, poor, Muslim, non-Muslim, is going to be tested. This is what this life is. But if you are attached to this book, this Quran, it will make those tests easier. Because Allah teaches you how to have patience, how to have uh, perseverance, knowing that after every difficulty there is relief. And uh, it's, if you really trust in these words and you trust in Allah, that he's with you and he's closer to you, as he says, in your jugular vein, and he knows the secrets of your heart, um, these are things that give you a great deal of sakina or peace and uh, contentment in your life. And I think if you search for these things, you make it your niya, your intention to search for these things, Allah will provide them for you. But, and also Allah will give you good friendships. And if you base your friendships on those people, I was talking to my friends here today, <laughs> that uh, having good friends that are attached by hearts, by minds, and by their soul, that their relationship with Allah and their relationship with the Quran are similar, these are the best friends because they will be there for you if you start to get off the path a little bit, they'll nudge you back on in a very sweet and loving way. And uh, they will encourage you through the tough times and be with you. And so Allah sends you those people in your life. And you'll know them. You'll know them when you find them. Because you will feel very calm and uh, peaceful and safe with these people. So it's always good to look for these people who have a little bit more knowledge than you do. A little bit older than you are. And also younger people that you can share with. And younger people that you can... Uh, uh, take from their new ideas and their technologies. So it's always good to have friends of all ages and friends of the Muslim community is wonderful. You can know people from all over the world. In Dallas, Texas, where I live, it's like Hajj. There's Muslims from all over the world. Um, I know a lot of converts. When I'm in Jordan, we have a convert group, for example, a lot of Americans. But in Dallas, we have people from everywhere, Chinese, Muslim, Chinese Muslim, Japanese Muslim. Turks, Pakistani, Indian, Bosnian, uh, Moroccan, in Indonesian, Malaysian. It's wonderful. It's such an incredible community of people from all over the world. And all that's very enriching. They always talk about travel being so enriching and providing knowledge. So avail yourself of going outside of your comfort zone and knowing only those people that are just like you and learning from them as well. It's, it's all a great blessing and a great joy. Before I converted, was there something missing? You feel, I don't know, if, if you feel like there's that fitra talking to you, 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 you feel uncomfortable because you're always a little bit different. <laughs> Funny story, I was coming home from New York um, after I had been an, a singer, an opera singer, and after I had been 
become a Muslim. And my mother came to the airport with one of my cousins. And I got off the plane, dressed like this, similarly. And my cousin looks at my mother and says, look at her, first an opera singer and now this. Like, so weird. Like, of course she's doing this now. She's so strange. So you feel a little bit odd. But there's this lovely hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, um, Islam came as something strange and it will leave as something strange. So give glad tidings to the strangers. Sometimes it's good to be the odd duck. <laughs> Usually the crowd is, the sheep are all, all following what is uh, popular and so forth. But it's those of us that kind of strike off on our own path that looking for the truth is a better way to go. I didn't know anything about Islam. I really didn't. I was... I was so in my singing bubble world, I didn't look at the news, I was busy singing, I had a schedule, I was running around Manhattan and singing in the evenings, rehearsing during the day, and there was no time for TV or movies or any of that nonsense or news. And when I get into something, I'm sort of, uh, the blinders come up. I was into music like the way I'm into slam now, I just, everything was music. I lived and breathed and ate and slept music, so I'm a little bit that way. So I, I really didn't know. I heard a little bit about, you know, problems in Iran with hostages and things like that. But uh, as I'd never really met Muslims or anybody from what I consider to be the Muslim world, east of us anyway, um, it, it hadn't really piqued my interest that much. So until I walked into the coffee shop with the Egyptian, it wasn't like, oh, I'm Egypt, hey, cool, <laughs> let's talk. One of my singer's friends, as I said, she said to me, what, are you ashamed of your body? You want to cover it? I'm like, oh, yeah. No. <laughs> and they didn't want to listen. You know, I said, you just don't understand. Let me talk to you about it. They didn't want to hear. You know, it's that kind of ego, like, no, these Middle Easterners, these, you know, Muslims there below us. And that ego again, you know, and uh, they weren't interested. And I was just dying to talk to anybody. I brought my best friend from Wisconsin, who was a very strict Christian. And we sat down, and she met my Egyptian friend, and we sat down one night, and I wanted to share something from the Quran with her, so I shared Surah Al-Ikhlas. <laughs> Allah, there is no God but He. It's like, oh, God is only one. Yikes, oh, she blew a fuse. What? God is three? No, no, shut the book. I can't take it. <laughs> no discussion, no discussion. So it was kind of a wall. Um, my friends would come to me and say, you know, you're making a mistake. You never, any, they would say to me, you never were any kind of a Christian anyway. I said, what? Just because I didn't go to church that much, I sang all this repertoire. I was a very good Christian in terms of I followed the tariq of Jesus. I followed the path of Jesus. I was tried to be kind. I tried to be merciful. I tried to be tolerant. I tried to take care of the poor and the needy. In what way was I not a Christian in those days? But a couple of friends said that to me. We're no kind of a Christian anyway. <laughs> like, okay. So uh, um, my mom, my father had passed away quite a long time ago. Uh, my mom was, uh, she hated this idea. She didn't like, because I would be standing out in Wisconsin, you know, you stand out like a sore thumb and you dress like this. Although we did have a mosque practically in my backyard in Wisconsin, strangely enough, when I found that out. But uh, she was a little bit embarrassed with how I looked, and of course her friends gave her a hard time. But she found that Islamically, it wasn't that much different than the Bible. So she would say, what does Islam say about? Well, that's what the Bible says. I said, I know, Mom, it's the same source. So she became easier over time, but she really didn't like the hijab at first. But then later she would help me pick up my clothes and like, oh, wear that outfit, <laughs> wear that scarf. My brother, on the other hand, oh, I, I have an only brother, and he took me to his house once, and he said, if you put that thing on your head, I'm going to change the locks on my on mother's door so you can't go in. I said, what am I doing that's so bad? <laughs> I said, I, I'm living with my mother right now. I'm taking care of her. If I'm out at night, I'm at the masjid with my friends. What am I doing? I said, if you know my life as a singer, I don't want to know your life as a singer. I said, if you knew what I was doing as a singer, you wouldn't be saying that this life is so bad. So um, my brother, actually, when my mother passed away, um, he said, that's enough. We don't need to be connected anymore. So. But Allah is very merciful. I have my husband's huge family in Jordan. I have an amazing international community of friends. So Allah replaces what you don't have with something better. Alhamdulillah. But I think with most converts, the, re the initial reaction is very tough. Very tough. And I was... I wanted the whole Muslim nine yards personality. I changed my name, and I took my husband's name, which isn't necessary for Muslim women to do, and I wanted to wear hijab badly because I wanted the whole nine yards thing. I can remember once I started to dress more modestly in New York, but I still had the hair and I still had the makeup. 
And in New York, when you pass a construction site with construction workers, the guys feel free to make all kinds of calls and whistles and things like that. And that was just annoying for me, always. So uh, I was dressed modestly one day, walking like the Sultana, walking past them, and uh, they still called out to me. There was a girl in front of me with a very short mini skirt and short top, and she was walking and enjoying the whistles and the calls. And I thought, no, not today, not me. And I walked by them, and I got the same reaction. And I had a jacket down to here and a skirt down to here, but I still had my hair and my makeup, and I said, this is not enough. So I went back to my hometown and eventually put on hijab there and went back to New York and I was like anonymous. Nobody bothered me anymore. It was great. Cab drivers, Muslim cab drivers would come across six lanes of traffic to pick me up. But other than that, like the men didn't see me anymore. And I used to have a lot of problem being tall and fair and dressing the part of a performer in New York. I used to have a lot of problems from the male gender. And uh, all of that went away and I said, okay, hijab enables me to be in control of myself as a woman and to say to people, talk to this person, talk to the face, talk to the intellect, talk to the heart. Don't be so concerned with my personal appearance. That's for my husband. But the rest of me, my intellect's for you, my character's for you, but be concerned with those things. I am not my face, I am not my figure, I am more than that. And I really like that, I really that, think it's very freeing and most of my hijabi friends will say the same thing they find we're a lot more free this way because as women we feel more in control of ourselves and our destinies. Re increase your reading, uh, look for different things to read, and the idea is to be open-minded. A lot of people and a lot of converts have said that they went into learning about Islam in order to refute it, you know, and to turn the Muslim into a Christian or something else, and they ended up becoming Muslim. So, Reading with an open mind is great. Even for Muslims, sometimes we look like, I want to find out why I shouldn't have to wear hijab. So look for the reasons why maybe Allah asks you to wear it. You know, look for reasons why. Questioning, I think, is good. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam questioned Allah, so we should question. It's not a religion of blind belief and by ordering. It's you're feel free to ask questions, which is great. Something I see sometimes online, and I have to laugh a lot, is someone will post something negative like, what did Muslims ever contribute to civilization? To which I say, have you ever gone to a doctor? Have you ever had an operation? Have you ever been in a hospital? Have you ever had to navigate at your way anywhere? Have you ever used a computer? Have you had coffee? <laughs> so many things, it's so wonderful, the, the Muslim contribution to the world. And everybody contributes. No one owns science. No one owns all the contra contributions of the world. Um, you know, Europe did not discover everything. You have to look what was going on in Europe during the Dark Ages in Spain was quite something different. So the Renaissance did not crawl out of a dark hole or out of a vacuum. There was a presence in Spain that opened the way to the Renaissance, and that was Muslims in Spain. Also, if you have a chance to travel, if you go into a mosque, particularly in any country like Turkey, for example, and you look around this mosque, it, it's so beautiful. We were in Bosra, yes, Bosra yesterday, and there's the, the great mosque, the Ulul Jame, and there's all this gorgeous calligraphy. And when you, you go into the, the massage of the mosques here, or you go into Sultan Ahmed and Sulaymaniyah Mosque, or any of the beautiful mosques here, there's so much beauty, amazing beauty, in, in our masajid, in our mosques, and you have to stop and think that evil does not create beauty. Beauty does not come out of violence or evil or hatred. Beauty comes out of love and devotion and all things beautiful. And there is an, uh, a hadith again that Allah loves beauty. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. So um, I think people with an open mind, those are the type of people who become Muslims. Or again, they start to study Islam in order to refute it and then also become a Muslim instead. Because... If you're really a truth seeker, you really want to find your way through all of the agendas nowadays and all of the marketing and all of everything else that pounds us from the internet and social media. If you're looking for the truth, you'll find it. Um, a lot of us talk about Islam. People ask me how many people embraced Islam through you. I said, I have no idea if anybody did because Allah guides. We are only, as he told his prophets, peace be upon them all, you are only messengers. You are only men. You are only messengers. Allah is the one who is responsible for guiding people. So leave the guidance to Allah, but uh, allow yourself to receive that guidance, allow yourself to learn. Uh, there's a big, wonderful world out there to explore and travel, and we've been very blessed to be able to do that. And it's, uh, 
it's wonderful for your mind and your heart and your soul to look at other civilizations and realize that they also have ways to contribute to the life that you live. Even if you don't become a Muslim, there are wonderful things to read in the Quran that really will help your life, even if you don't embrace Islam. Um, Americans in particular, they have a lot of questions about life. And I often want to say, but there's an answer in the book that we read. And they don't look to, uh, Westerners don't look to Islam. They don't include it in something that they study to look for answers for things. They tend to take things from the Bible and, and from their own historical sources. So be open to the world. Be open to other civilizations that contributed to who you are and what you are now. And Islam is definitely part of that. There's so many great little stories, uh, even about Columbus discovering America. Um, he was looking for another way to get to India where he didn't have to go through the Muslims, notably the Ottomans, to get to India for the spice route. He wanted to find another way that he didn't have to deal with the Muslims, so he went uh, west and bumped into America. So, and a lot of his navigators on his ship were Muslims, had been Muslims in Spain. That's a story, there's a great story about Dracula. The story of Dracula was really just uh, a leader in Transylvania, Vlad the Impaler, who uh, disliked Muslims intently, so he was given an order by the Pope of Dracula, which is like essentially an Ottoman hater, and myths grew up about this man that he impaled people on a pike, and from that, Bram Stoker made a great story of Dracula, and again, it's kind of from the Muslims. <laughs> so I'm like, if you look a little deeper, you'll find Islam in a lot of history throughout the world if you just open your mind to it. And those are some little funny tidbits, but... There were so many incredible discoveries in, and uh, the Muslims took what the Greeks and the Romans had started and, and took it a step further in Spain and then the Ottomans continued with other things. So um, there isn't just only one group of people in the world that contribute to the world we have today. All civilizations, all past histories have had a part in it and it's, it's very edifying to study Islam and what Islam has contributed to the world today too. So I think even in that point, if you don't want to look at it even religiously, you can look at the contributions and wonder how in such a short time, after the demise of Prophet Muhammad, there was this explosion in seekers of knowledge from Baghdad to Andalusia, and then it went to Morocco, to Ottomans and so forth, and it continued for 1440, are we 44 this year? 1444 years. So. It's a long civilization, and we're a little bit quiet right now, but uh, inshallah we will come back again as a strong force in the world for good and to help solve some of the problems that we're facing in the world today too. Islam offers a lot of great solutions to a lot of the problems we're facing worldwide. So I invite you to explore with an open mind. <laughs>